<clears throat> I'd like to speak to you today about an urgent responsibility the Congress has to uphold the national security needs of the United States and, quite frankly, of our partners as well. <clears throat> this cannot wait. Congress needs to pass supplemental funding for Ukraine before they break for the holiday resources. It's as simple as that. Frankly, I think it's stunning that we've gotten to this point in the first place. While Congress, Republicans in Congress, are willing to give Putin the greatest gift he could hope for and abandon our global leadership, <clears throat> not just in Ukraine, but beyond that. We've all seen the brutality that Putin has inflicted on Ukraine, invading another country, trying to subjugate his neighbors to his iron rule, committing atrocities, atrocities against Ukrainian civilians, trying to plunge them into the cold and darkness of winter by bombing their electrical grids so they don't have any heat during the winter, <clears throat> or electricity for that matter, kidnapping thousands of Ukraine, thousands of Ukrainian children from their parents and families and keeping them in Russia. Russian forces are committing war crimes. It's as simple as that. It's stunning. Who is prepared to walk away from holding Putin accountable for this behavior? Who among us is really prepared to do that? You know, for the better part of two years, the brave people of Ukraine have denied Russia a victory on the battlefield. They've defeated Vladimir Putin's ambition to dominate Ukraine. And the people of the United States can and should take pride, they should take pride, that we've enabled Ukraine's success <clears throat> thanks to the steady supply of weapons and ammunition. We provided them together with our partners and our allies. I just did a meeting with the G7, which was one of the issues we discussed all of the European leaders. We are prepared to stay with us, stay with Ukraine, <clears throat> and our European friends are as well. Who in the United States is prepared to walk away from that? I tell you, I'm not prepared to walk away, and I don't think the American people are either. If Putin takes Ukraine, he won't stop there. It's important to see the long run here. He's going to keep going. He's made that pretty clear. If Putin attacks a NATO ally, if he keeps going, and then he attacks a NATO ally, where well, we've committed as a NATO member that we defend every inch of NATO territory, then we'll have something that we don't seek and that we don't have today. American troops fighting Russian troops. American troops fighting Russian troops if he moves into other parts of NATO. Make no mistake, today's vote is going to be long remembered, and history is going to judge harshly those who turn their back on freedom's cause. We can't let Putin win. Say it again, we can't let Putin win. It's in our overwhelming national interest and international interest of all our friends. Any disruption <clears throat> in our ability to supply Ukraine clearly strengthens Putin's position. We've run out of money to be able to do that in terms of authorization. Extreme Republicans are playing chicken with our national security holding Ukraine's funding hostage to their extreme partisan border policies. Let me be clear. We need real solutions. I support real solutions at the border. I put forward a comprehensive plan the first day I came into office. I made it clear that we need Congress to make changes to fix what is a broken immigration system, because we know, we all know it's broken. And I'm willing to do significantly more. But in terms of changes of policy and to provide resources we need at the border, I'm ready to deal change policy as well. I've asked for billions of dollars from more border agents, more immigration judges, more asylum officers. Republicans have to decide if they want a political issue or if they want a solution at the border. Do they really want a solution? It cannot be sustained as it is now. We need a real solution. And my team has been engaged in negotiations with Senate Democrats and Republicans on border security. Democrats. Democrats have put forward a bipartisan compromise on the table. Leader Schumer and Senate Democrats also have offered to let Republicans propose amendments to that border proposal. But Republicans have objected. They said, no, we, we, we don't want you to even introduce your proposal because then we're not going to, And even though the Democrats say you can amend it any way you want. No, no, we don't want to do that. This has to be a negotiation. Republicans think they get everything they want without any bipartisan compromise. That's not the answer. That's not the answer. 
And now they're willing to literally kneecap Ukraine on the battlefield and damage our national security in the process. Look, I know we have our divisions at home. Let's get past them. This is critical. Petty, partisan, angry politics can't get in the way of our responsibility as a leading nation in the world. And literally, the entire world is watching. The entire world is watching. What will the United States do? And think if we don't support Ukraine. What's the rest of the world going to do? What's Japan going to do, which is supporting Ukraine now? What's going to happen in terms of the G7? What's going to happen in terms of our NATO allies? What are they going to do? If we walk away now, <coughs> we'll only embolden other would-be aggressors. <coughs> so I'm calling on Congress to do something and do the right thing, to stand with the people of Ukraine, stand against the tyranny of Putin, stand for freedom, literally stand for freedom. Let's get this done. We're the reason Putin has not totally overrun Ukraine and moved beyond that. And you all heard me talk about it before. If, in fact, we walk away, how many of our European friends are going to continue to fund? And at what rates are they going to continue to fund it? This is too serious. Like I said, I am willing to make significant compromises on the border. We need to fix the broken border system. It is broken. And thus far, I've gotten no response. So I just, uh, we're going to be a vote a little bit later today. We'll know where we go from there. But I wanted to make this comment before the vote, and I'm sure I'll be talking with you after the vote. Thank you very much for listening. Appreciate it. Mr. President, given the current impasse, would you be okay with Democrats willing to uh, put more on border policy to get this current package through? Yes. What would I, you be okay with Democrats agreeing to? Uh, I've already laid out in our negotiations with Langford and others what we're willing to do significantly more, particularly by starting off equipping the border capacity that we need on the border, from judges to more border security, in addition to making some substantive changes. But they're unwilling to do it. We thought we, I, I really thought, <clears throat> I felt good for a while. I thought we were making some real progress. Langford's a decent guy. It looked like he was prepared to move in a way, in a direction, that we could come up with a compromise, both changing in substance, changing policy on the border, as well as security at the border. But they've walked away. It's take everything we have here, um, their one proposal, which is extreme, or nothing. In the meantime, the nothing means we don't get any support for our friends and our the innocent people of Ukraine. Anyway, I'll President talk to you more Ukraine after the and also China. President Biden on Ukraine and also China. Uh, there is polling by the Associated Press that shows that almost 70 percent of Americans, including 40 percent of Democrats, believe that you acted either illegally or unethically in regards to your family's business interests. Can you explain to the Americans, uh, to Americans amid this impeachment inquiry, why you interacted with so many of your son and brother's foreign business associates? I'm not going to comment that I did not. And it's just a bunch of lies. You didn't interact with many of their lies. business associates? I did not. There's what, lies. About the critical importance of uh, supporting Ukraine through funding and why we need Congress to take urgent action to stand with them in their fight for freedom. Just today, we announced our latest security assistance package to support them. This is a 50-second package of weapons and equipment that we're sending to Ukraine to help meet urgent battlefield needs as they continue to fight this counteroffensive. Now, this package includes more artillery, ammunition, uh, to help Ukraine defend their territory. And it includes more air defense capabilities to protect Ukrainian cities and infrastructure from Russian missiles. I said the other day we fully expect the Russians to go after the energy infrastructure, so this air defense capability is meant to help them uh, uh, defend against those attacks. But again, as Kareen said, without additional funding, uh, these weapons will be among the last that we'll be able to send. Cutting off support and giving v Vladimir Putin exactly what he wants, that would just be terrible, not just for the people of Ukraine, but for our own national security interests and absolutely the national security interests of our allies and partners in Europe. As you all know, President Biden participated as well today 
uh, in a virtual meeting of G7 leaders. Uh, and in light of all the number of significant events going on in the world, uh, they felt it was important to meet before the end of the year. Absolutely, they discussed about the, the, the issue of supporting Ukraine uh, and how important that is for all of them. They also, of course, touched on the Middle East and a range of other global challenges. Can you talk a little bit about the specific sticking points and what key Republican proposals the White House is against? No, I'm not going to get into negotiating here from uh, from the podium. And the president also talked about how if Putin were to take Ukraine, he wouldn't stop, and eventually it could even lead to U.S. troops fighting Russian troops. If this aid does not get passed, how likely is that scenario? There, there, there should be by everybody. And if you're up on Capitol Hill and you believe in national security, uh, there should be a genuine concern about what happens if you just let Putin go, if you just let him have Ukraine. Because make no mistake, Selena, he hasn't given up his strategic goal of subjugating the entire country. He doesn't believe it ought to exist as a sovereign state. And so we can't support Ukraine. Their chief advisor yesterday said they're likely to lose this war if they lose U.S. support. And Putin gets all of Ukraine, then what? Then where does he go? Because right then, he's up against the eastern flank of NATO. And if you think the cost of supporting Ukraine is high now, just imagine how much higher it's going to be, not just in national treasure, but in American blood, if he starts going after one of our NATO allies. Because as the president also said, we take our Article 5 commitments very seriously. And what we've had over the last two years is a, Ukraine, a Ukrainian military actually clawing back territory and pushing back Russian aggression without any foreign uh, boots on the ground, including no American boots. Uh, American boots would very much have to be involved if Mr. Putin is let to uh, have this uh, strategic victory in Ukraine and then perhaps goes after one of our NATO allies. Can you say anything more about the tone of the conversation um, with the G7 leaders on the aid to Ukraine? Did any of them express frustration at the U.S. or concern? And did any, did any of them say that they may you know, follow through and similarly cut aid to Ukraine if the U.S. doesn't follow through? Uh, there's a uh, the, the joint statement's out there. I encourage you to read it. It's, it's a fairly lengthy statement. That's why I didn't uh, go into it in too much detail here in the opening statement of, my, of mine. But uh, clearly, Ukraine was discussed. All the G7 leaders agreed, in principle, that support has got to keep flowing to Ukraine. We've got to keep helping them defend themselves against uh, Russian aggression. I'm not going to speak for each leader and what they did or did not say to the president. Yesterday, the State Department said there was a new deal that was rejected for my colleague Evan Gershkovich um, from the Russians. Um, can you say anything more about what that deal looked like? Um, any, any other details you can offer? No. Okay. Explain what's at stake here if Congress <coughs> pass the funding in terms of U.S. national security interest in the Indo-Pacific? I'm going to take that, take that question. John, um, there's the border security fight, but Speaker Johnson also said that he doesn't want to move forward on Ukraine funding because the administration has not pro provided um, a clear enough roadmap for how Ukraine wins this conflict using all of this U.S. assistance. What more can the White House do to lay out that roadmap for Congress? I lost count of the number of briefings that we provided to members of Congress in a classified and unclassified setting uh, about what we're doing to support Ukraine um, and what Ukraine's ultimate goals and, and strategy are. It's their war. Um, they get to decide what victory looks like. They get to decide what plans they execute. They get to decide what targets they hit. They get to decide where they put their troops on the battlefront. But let me put it clearly. We want Ukraine to be whole and free. We want their internationally recognized borders to be respected by everyone, including especially Russia and Mr. Putin. There shouldn't be a single Russian boot on Ukrainian soil. We've been clear about that. Number two, uh, as Ukraine continues to fight for that outcome, we're going to do everything we can to make sure they've got the tools and the capabilities to do that. And that assistance has been evolving over time. I can't, I, I have been talking about this myself from two different podiums now. It's been evolving over the last two years uh, as the war has evolved. Uh, and we have been nothing but transparent with Congress about each and every security assistance package that has been delivered to Ukraine. Every single one of them, including the one I just talked about, is done in full consultation with members of Congress. Number three, the issue of accountability. We actually share the concerns over that. We've been sharing concerns over accountability of those systems and those weapons since we started giving them to Ukraine. And I'll tell you something else, the Ukrainians are also concerned about that. 
they've said that they also want uh, better accountability in their own system for where this, uh, these munitions and these systems are going. And we have added uh, personnel to our embassy, military personnel into, in, into our embassy staff for that purpose alone, to work with the Ukrainians on accountability. The last thing I'll say on this is, it's a war. And if you think you can count where every single artillery shell is going and every single bullet that's fired, then you're dreaming. It's a war, it's combat. Um, now, the, we're doing the best we can uh, to, uh, to account for the aid we're giving them and how they're using it. We're giving them training on how to do it, and we're even doing retraining on how to do it, um, including some pretty sophisticated systems like Abrams tanks and now F-16s. Um, so we all take that seriously, but it is a war, and it is a war that we are committed to seeing Ukraine win. But is it possible to be more specific with Congress, not just about Ukraine's desire to win, its drive to win, but also specifically how it's going to get past the stalemate that it finds itself in now? <laughs> Again, Nancy, we have, I don't know how many briefings that we have, have done on Capitol Hill. Again, in classified settings, and we'll keep doing that. Um, we certainly can be held responsible and answer questions about what we're doing to help Ukraine, our communications with the Ukrainian uh, armed forces and what they need and why we're giving them what we're giving them, in what scale and in what time frame. Uh, but it is Ukraine's war. They have to be the ones speaking to their plans and their operations, their tactics, their targets. Uh, and, you know, uh, they, Congress has also heard multiple times from President Zelensky. Uh, and I'm, I have absolutely no doubt that the President, President Zelensky, will be more than happy to continue to uh, inform members of Congress going forward. Is it your current assessment that the Ukraine war is at a stalemate and would additional funding help break that stalemate? We won't characterize the the, the state of the uh, of the battlefront. That's really for the Ukrainians to do. We've uh, we've really taken uh, a position of not armchair quarterbacking that and, and slapping bumper stickers on it. Um, I would tell you or point you to what President Zelensky has said himself. They haven't made as much progress in the counteroffensive as he wanted to. Some of his generals have said uh, similar things. We would agree that uh, they didn't go as far as fast as they themselves wanted to go. Um, and again, as winter sets in. Um, I don't think we should expect any more than we did last winter that the fighting's just going to stop. Uh, the, these two sides will probably keep at it. Uh, right now, uh, there's not a lot of movement on the battlefront, um, uh, either in the east or in the south. But the Russians have made it very clear that they're not just going to sit in camp all winter, that they want to go on the offensive. And they've got the advantage of manpower that they can throw at this stuff. Uh, and so we've got to make sure, that's why the president was so strident today, we've got to make sure that Ukraine continues to get the, the support that they need going into these cold winter months. The president has stated publicly many times, as have a number, a number of his aides, you included, uh, that you're all confident that the president will be able to persuade the United States Congress to renew funding for the Ukraine Armed Forces. Uh, today he held that video call with the leaders of the G7 and it's manifestly clear that he's not necessarily going to be able to deliver on that promise and yet for the better part of a year or more than a year he's been telling those same G7 leaders in essence I've got this I will get that funding out of the United States Congress. Today he cannot make that promise to the same group of leaders. Is that a source of some embarrassment for him and for the United States? No, I disagree that it's not manifestly clear, James. I'm not sure where you're getting that phrase. Uh, the president remains confident that support to Ukraine is important for our national security interests. He remains confident that he's going to continue to work with members of Congress uh, to get this done. He said so himself in, in, those, uh, in those comments. Um, and he's confident, oh, by the way, that there's still strong bipartisan and bicameral support for Ukraine up on Capitol Hill. We got a small number of Republicans that are pushing back on that. The president's not gonna give up on this. You've also got a small window now. Well, the window's definitely getting smaller. I've been saying that for weeks now. The runway's getting shorter and shorter, and we've got basically to the end of this month.